Welcome everybody. Welcome to World Love Week. I'm Scott Patton from www.powerpodcasters.com and I'm going to be host uh, for this very special session with you today. I'm a proud member of the founding faculty of uh, at tpcourses.com and we're in for a real treat because today's guest is a self-healing expert. He's an internationally acclaimed educator, a philanthropist, bilingual speaker. Oh, I wish I could know, I knew more than four words in French. I'm in Canada, we're bilingual, but I'm not. And he's president emeritus of Parker University. He's the author of the best-selling book, The Power of Self-Healing, as well as Four Steps for Living a Fabulous Life, co-author of Chicken Soup for the Chiropractic Soul and the Well-Adjusted Soul. He's a frequent guest on radio and TV, and he's been featured on Dr. Phil, The Doctors, Fox News, and numerous syndicated morning shows. And he has his own popular international weekly radio show, Self-Healing with Dr. Fab. Dr. Fab Mancini, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I am doing great, Scott, and thank you so much for having this time because I've been looking forward to having this conversation with you. Yeah, me too. And it's, uh, it's really, really wonderful that we can get together and we can share. And I'm up in Canada. You're down, I believe, in Texas, right? Yes, I'm in Dallas, Texas right now. Wonderful. Did, did you get all that rain? Yeah, we went through a lot of rain, a lot of flooding. And, uh, you know, the city's still recovering a little bit. We just don't have the type of equipment to try to get it done as soon as I, I think everybody wanted to. But we've had such hot weather the last few days that I think it's uh, finally drying up some of the places that were just inundated with water. Cool. So your book, The Power of Self-Healing, tell us a little bit about that because we're all we're into love, love in the business, and you're obviously uh, you know right in there with with the direction of your your book. Well, you know it's interesting. This book um, uh, it's become an international bestseller. It's in twelve languages right now. Hay House is the publisher, and one of the things that I uh, I have found is that this is my fourth book and I wanted to bring a message to the world of empowerment. A message that allow people to understand that all of us are already designed to heal naturally from the inside out, not from the outside in. And that most of us are taking our health for granted. The second mm -hmm. thing is the fact that when I started researching for over 25 years, what were the main attributes that help people heal I learned that healing doesn't happen just on a physical plane. It happens on an emotional plane and on a spiritual plane. So I wanted individuals to recognize that every disease out there or every healing procedure needs to be filtered through those three dimensions, I call them. The physical, the emotional, and the spiritual. And when you do that, you have a much greater opportunity to actually heal. So one of the things that um, I thought it was interesting is that when I started talking and listening and researching the science and the evidence about how we heal emotionally, the number one emotion that came up that heals us emotionally is love. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was just so excited because this is one of the things that I think most people don't realize, that if we just love ourselves enough, if we just be a little bit kinder, a little bit more patient, begin to look at the things that are good about us instead of always criticizing the things that we don't like about ourselves, all of that is what actually facilitates healing in your own body. Wow. Yeah, that's wonderful. I totally agree with that. And I, I think you make a great point is sometimes we'll take these pills, but the problem is because of all this emotional or spiritual stuff that we've twisted the wrong way, that's twisting the juice out of our life. Yeah, and, and I think what happens a lot of times is that, you know, love has a lot to do with self-worth and I think what happens a lot of times is that when we don't love ourselves enough we then become susceptible to disease and to other things that actually run our lives because you know when you're worthy you can't help but to live in a world of abundance and I don't mean just physical abundance like money and, and wealth etc I'm talking about your own healing potential and when you're actually feeling good about yourself, you tend to create chemistry from your brain and your body that is actually healing chemistry. Mm -hmm. Like we have a, a hormone called serotonin and oxytocin, and those are like 
healthy hormones, the one that actually makes us happy, the ones that gives us energy. And many people out there are trying to find these feelings uh, on outside entities or, you know, on, on, on people to make them happy when in reality, we're the only ones that are capable of doing that ourselves. So it's, it's, it's just when I looked at the evidence, when I looked at the research that has been done in particular to this topic of love, I just couldn't help but to recognize that there's so much going on there that needs to actually take place. Right. Well, that's cool. So one of the things that you've done is you've given testimony to the White House Commission for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. And you also served on the Texas Governor Advisory Board on Physical Fitness. And I'm really curious of what the experience was like uh, giving testimony to the to a White House Commission. I mean, to me, that sounds like pretty uh, pretty big, heady stuff, right? It's, it's a very formal process. And of course, it's one of the ones that you kind of sit at the end of one table and you have people all looking at you and with their big <laughs> microphones. And this was during the Clinton era where Clinton wanted to bring complementary and alternative medicine into the fold and created the White House Commission. And I was able to actually give testimony as to why the importance of non-traditional uh, healthcare, why the importance of uh, non, uh, non-traditional methods of healing, what was the science behind professions such as chiropractic, professions such as acupuncture, what was so healing about getting a massage and, um, and homeopathy, etc. So it was very exciting because they had a lot of good questions and uh, I still remember that day. I was a little nervous walking into that room, but then they made me feel so comfortable as soon as I started speaking that I really enjoyed the experience. Cool. So what would you say was the one message you left with that group? The one message is that there's not one thing that actually helps us heal. And that healing necessarily does not come from the outside in. Most of the causes, the root causes of our problem are our behaviors, our thinking. And I wanted them to understand that you can manage symptoms, but that's not truly healthcare. That healthcare begins by preventing a condition from ever showing up. And after 30 years in the healthcare business, uh, in, in profession, I can tell you that I've seen healing after healing when individuals are open enough to be able to deal with the root cause of the problem, to be able to find out if there's something underlying to the symptoms that I started having. Could it be a resentment? Could it be a worry and an anxiety? Could it be the fact that I was hurt? Um, and those unresolved emotions, I call them, are the ones that actually break our body and our system down, which then unfortunately allows us to be susceptible to disease. Hmm. Right. So one of the other things, I mean, you've had an amazing life and I just, I'm so happy to meet you and hopefully we'll, we'll intertwine our paths uh, moving forward so we keep, I can keep up to date. But you, uh, you were one of the youngest presidents of a college or university and you led Parker University in 1999, I believe. And uh, you were there, I think, for 13 or, or more years. No, I actually started in 1999, and I left uh, in 2012. I retired after 13 and a half years. Right. So tell us, what was the, that experience like, president of a university? That must have been amazing. Well, it's interesting because I've had three careers in my life, and the first one was healthcare, you know, being a doctor. The second one is the one we just mentioned, being president of a university, being an educator. And in that one is so interesting because I wasn't really planning on going into that profession, but the founder of our school passed away and he was my mentor. He, w- he had mentored me for many years and I was serving on the board before. I had already donated so much to the school. I won almost every award that they have for an alumni. And when he passed away, the board kept asking me if I would consider joining in. But I was too busy enjoying my practice, loving my patients, uh, having my own business. I really wasn't thinking that I wanted to do that. But after a year and a half of saying no, they just kept persisting. And then I felt, well, maybe there's something there that they feel that I'm really needed. And I thought I'll do it for six months to a year, but it lasted uh, uh, 13 and a half years. 
But it goes back to this. My father uh, um, taught us a great lesson in life. We're five boys in my family, so I have four brothers. And he wanted to be a professional soccer player. But his father said that he needed to go into business and take care of the business because he was the oldest uh, or second oldest of a family of 13. So all of a sudden, my father could not be the professional soccer player that he wanted to be, and he wasn't happy. Now, he had a lot of money, but he wasn't happy. So growing up, my father said to us, you needed to choose a career that made you happy. And I love being a doctor. But as I started becoming a president of a university, I realized that I love being an educator too. I love to be able to inspire people to look at things differently, to take uh, into account different perspectives and things, and, and really inspire them to want to be life lifelong learners and I started really loving that experience and and then I saw my practice be so you know my father was a professional soccer player and uh, I realized that uh, growing up uh, um, he never was able to fulfill his dream you know his father owned a major company and he would always tell him that he needed to go to business school instead of playing soccer professional soccer so my father was not really happy growing up and then he took over the company because my grandfather passed away at an early age. And he was even more miserable because he wasn't what he wanted. And he had money, but money doesn't make you happy, as you know. Right. In fact, there was a study that was recently done uh, that they interviewed over 500,000 households that said that after $75,000 of personal income, your happiness quotient doesn't change. And mm -hmm. most of us are wanting always more and more. But in, in, in reality, that's not what makes us happy. So he would always teach us, choose a career that you love. And I started loving being a doctor. I started loving being an educator. And that experience just really taught me that I had a gift for inspiring people to want to learn, to look at things from a different perspective, to keep an open mind, to try different things and see for themselves that there's not one way to do things in life. And then I started... Uh, going back to what my father said, and that is doing what you love. But then I went a little bit step beyond. So now I'm raising my own children. I have an 18-year-old and a 15-year-old. And I added one more sentence to what my dad taught us. I teach my children that you want to do what you love, but then you want to find someone to pay you to do it. <laughs> yeah. Because the reality of it is it's an exchange. And you can do what you love, but if you don't have that exchange, you know, money is only a way to support your passion. And when you love what you do, you got to have the revenue to be able to do it long term. And so that's the way that I've kind of allowed myself to live my life. And then after I retire, after 13 and a half years, I started doing more television and radio and lecturing all over the world every week. And that's what I've been doing for the last two years to be able to reach a bigger mass of people. Uh, in order to be able to help them understand that if they just really love themselves more, if they do what they love, if they surround themselves with people that love them, if they all of a sudden only have positive things to think about other people, so that way positive things come back to them, all of a sudden they can be a healthy human being, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. That's it. Uh... That's amazing. That's certainly a yeah a wonderful way to look at the world, and I know it's very powerful, and it certainly works because how we it really is very much a choice, right? It's a choice, and it's interesting. Uh, when I, in 1988, I was attending a seminar, and the speaker was actually showing us how to write our own mission statement for life, and they gave us a series of questions to ask ourselves. Some of them were. Uh, what was I born for? Uh, what do I lo love doing the most? Where do I lose a sense of time when I'm doing it? What do other people tell me that I'm really good at? What do I feel that I'm the best at? You know, uh, et cetera. What have I, where have I really excelled and accomplished things in what areas, et cetera? So I went and took a legal path and went to the beach and started writing all the things that answers to these questions and all the things that I wanted to do as my life mission statement. And after almost four hours of writing, I, I kid you not, wow. pages after pages, our goal was to summarize it into one sentence. 
So my sentence was very simple. And this has been my mission statement, my personal mission statement since 1988. And that is to learn to unconditionally love myself mm. so I may unconditionally love others. I find that when we love ourselves enough, it's really what sets the foundation, not only to be healthy, but to also be very successful in life, to be able to have great relationships with the people around us, to be able to maximize the potential in every particular area of our lives, whether spiritual, professional, social, etc. So to me, I have dedicated my life since 1988 in that particular word that says to learn to love myself. You see, we're not given um, the opportunity in most cases to actually have that love for ourselves. We're conditioned based on our, the experiences that we have had since childbirth. So if you were born in a house that gave you a tremendous amount of love, that's great that you have that as a foundation. But if you weren't, then all of a sudden you don't know what that feels like or if it's even possible for you. But let's say that you were grown into that love, but then as you get older, there are so many conditions to that love now that you begin to resent those same parents that loved you. You see, and now all of a sudden you have love that is more unconditional, but then now it's conditional. And unless I behave a certain way, unless right. I do what they want me to do, and then you go into school and you start trying to please your teachers, and then you start trying to please your bosses, and then you're trying to please your relationships. And most of that, unfortunately, most of us forget ourselves in that process. And our lives begins about pleasing and loving others instead of loving ourselves enough that others can then automatically love us because it will be clear who we are and what we're all about. So how do you make that shift? Because one of the things I was thinking about as you were speaking was, you know, I've been in situations where some of the people in my life were very negative or uh, demeaning and that's, and if, and I mean, if it's just a, if it's a coworker, you know, you got to wait for them to quit or be fired or get promoted out of the office or something. Yeah, but if they're family, you're kind of stuck with them for life. And then how, how do you deal with that, right? That's great. So I'm going to tell you uh, what the father of stress said. His name was Hans Selye. And Hans Selye discovered stress. But he used to say that it's not stress that hurts us. It's not stress that kills us. It's our response to it. So just like in stress, whenever you have... An, a, an opportunity or an experience in which you're not feeling love. Maybe you're feeling judged. Maybe you're feeling um, hate, you know, which is a repression of love, a form of repression of love. Our key is to be able to respond in a way that is compassionate, that is constructive, that is not necessarily putting me in a position that now I'm going to doubt my love or I'm going to doubt the love of someone else because how they're coming across. I give you a perfect example. You know, most of us have been in relationships at one point or another. And you can go from a relationship in which, you can, let's say it's your partner, in which you can be at the point of ecstasy that you're making love and you're becoming one body in that experience. But let's say the next morning, now you're having the most heated argument that you've ever had and you're yelling at each other, judging each other, saying things that you'll regret for the rest of your life. You know, I often teach people, take a deep breath before you say anything you're going to regret. Because when we're hurt, it's so easy to just shout it out as a defense mechanism. But unfortunately, those are things that most people never forget. They may be able to forgive you, but they usually won't forget. So yeah. I just want you to understand that regardless of how the world outside of us is treating us when it comes to love. The most important thing is because you love yourself enough, you will never allow an external party, an external circumstance, an external experience, an external event to ever change that. So you, what you do in this case, let's say that my partner is not loving me very much right now and is really angry at me and is actually saying things that are really hurtful. I can take that act and say to myself, wow, she must be hurt. There must be something going on with her that is causing her to say like this because I know her.
I've been with her for years. I know this is not the right, the person that would be really meaning all of the things that she's saying. So you develop compassion, acceptance, you know, instead of feeling like, well, if you're going to say that to me, well, that's what I'm going to do to you. And it becomes this argument. And that's unfortunately what destroys most relationships out there. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well said. I really like that. And I think it's a it's a, an issue that we all I mean, it's the test that we get sometimes minute by minute, sometimes daily, sometimes annually, where someone comes in and they're disruptive. And the, the decision always is, do I still love myself unconditionally? Do I love them unconditionally, even though they're a Gandhi, I think, was probably the best example of that. Right. What? Yeah, and and I and really you said the word that is my favorite word, and that is unconditionally, because love can be very conditional in today's times, you know, and it's just the way society has conditioned us to love, to to express our love, you know, when we do things that pleases our parents, we get a lot of love, a lot of attention. You're so good, you're so nice, compliments, etc. When we please our bosses. We get a lot of attention, but I want you to know that that attention is not really real. I want you to know that what really is real is how you feel about yourself during the act of whatever you do. And whenever you love yourself enough, what happens is that you only typically do things that are loving towards others. Because if you're loving yourself enough, you're not going to put yourself in a position to even waste energy by being angry or by trying to get back on somebody that hurts you or by spreading rumors about people just because Mm. you know that you've been hurt and you want to have them have that same hurt. So the lesson here is very simple. You know, one time I heard a statement that really changed my life. It was 27 years ago and it was one of my friends and mentor, Dr. Wayne Dyer. And Wayne shared this statement with me. I don't think he was the original uh, person that wrote it or said it. But he said, if we can just learn to appreciate that we are not human beings living a spiritual experience, but that we're actually spiritual beings living a human experience, then everything in our lives will be much better. So when I read that, when I heard that, whenever I experienced that, I started recognizing that I needed to treat myself as a spiritual uh, person first rather than a human person first. Because as a human, I'm already imperfect. I already have flaws. I'm already gonna live a certain amount of time in this earth. I know my body is gonna change from the moment I'm born to the moment that I'm no longer uh, on earth. I know that I'm gonna make mistakes. I know I'm gonna be impatient sometimes. I know I'm gonna lose my temper. But as a spiritual being, I get to see myself as a pure spirit, as just a beam of light that is pure, that is, you know, pure love, is pure essence. Right. And that's what I look for in everyone I meet. That's what I look for in every experience that I go uh, through, because I realize that when I see that in the world, it's exactly what the world will see in me. And it makes all the difference in the world and how your quality of life really goes from then on. As you were speaking, one of the things that occurred to me was it's not about not being hurt or not feeling hurt or not feeling pain. It's our response or our reaction to that uh, that's so important. So we can re- we can react with, oh, I'm really mad. I'm going to hurt you or I'm going to gossip about you or I'm going to you know, punch you or I'm going to whatever. Or you can say, okay, I am hurt. I feel like I'm hurt. This is an, an opportunity for me to exercise my unconditional love in this imperfect physical world that I am as opposed to the, the perfect spiritual one. Yeah, because what happens is that as we're experiencing an emotion like that, if we take it personal, if we feel that the other person is really trying to attack us, our natural response is going to be one of fight or flight. Those are our natural responses. So either I'm going to fight because I'm going to be defensive or I'm going to be so hurt that I'm just going to walk away and I'm just going to say I'm done with you. You know, the challenge is that that response was never meant to be 
a response towards our emotional relationships. That was an a response that was meant to be like if you are walking at night your dog and all of a sudden, you know, you see these bright eyes coming at you and it's actually a, uh, a Rottweiler coming to chase right. you. And that Rottweiler is hungry and is salivating. So all of a sudden you're running and your dog goes one way and you're trying to find escape. But let's imagine that you don't find a place to hide. Then you're gonna break down, right? You're gonna get yeah. tired, you're gonna fall down, and then that Rottweiler is gonna be all over you. Well, the problem in life today is that most of us are waking up every day with that Rottweiler chasing us in one form or another. Whether it's our financial stress, our relationship stress, our job stress, all the stressors in the world that are really a physical illness, all of these things are the ones that are actually not helping us in our health potential because it's breaking our bodies down. Right. So we have to identify, first of all, where is that coming from? And then we have to choose a different response. Yes, maybe the Rottweiler is following me, but could I do something different to make them stop? You know, is there a way that I can try to find something to be able to feed them so that way they get distracted? Or can I go somewhere and jump on a tree or, you know, that that's going to save me? Or do I find, you know, the backyard of somebody and get inside and close the door so I can be safe from that Rottweiler? So the responses that we choose is really the most important thing. But what I find is that when you love yourself enough, your responses tend to be constructive. They tend to be what's who was best for you rather than one that becomes destructive and that's gonna harm you in some way or another. Right. So we've lost the video again. <clears throat> if you can just check, there it comes. Okay, cool. Oh. Yeah. So uh, you wanna repeat that one? No, that's good because I can put some pictures of Rodweilers in. Okay, and, and I don't know what's happening with this phone and, you know. It's, it's <clears throat> part of, doing stuff, being able to connect, there's, there's the challenge, right? Let's talk a little bit about making a difference. Obviously, you've made a lot of difference in a lot of people's lives, uh, but do you have a particular cause or something that is near and dear to your heart? Well, the thing that really drives me every day is the fact that I do want people to love themselves more. I do want people to be able to enjoy the health that they were designed to have. Not to be able to be complaining at the fact that they can't do the things they love to do, that they can't take the trips they wanna take, that they can't play the sports they wanna play, that they can't lift their grandchildren because of their arthritis, that they can't be able to um, do something or climb a mountain or go hiking because of their obes obesity. We know today in science that over 65% of the healthcare conditions that we have are chronic in nature. And most of the root causes of those chronic conditions are our lifestyle choices. So I spend my life really identifying better lifestyle choices that give us better outcomes. So I do a lot of that for Fox News on television on a weekly basis. I do that on radio interviews on a weekly basis. I do that lecturing on a weekly basis. I do that by doing online summits and different things that reach a lot of people all over the world. So my passion is to really allow individuals to see themselves like I see them. Allow them to understand that they were meant to be living in abundance, not, not scarcity, not survival. That they were meant to have very fulfilling relationships that were mirror images of themselves where you are in a healthy relationship. Not that you are in a relationship and you expect the other person to be different than you. If they were more on time, I'd be happy. If they were a little bit, uh, if they would dress a little bit better, I'd be happy. Why do we want anyone to be like us? That was never meant yeah. to be the case. We're, we're so supposed true. to be different individuals. The problem is that most of us don't focus on the, the great things about the people that we love. Most of us spend over 80% of our time focusing on the things that we don't like about the person. And the law of attraction says that if you think about something, you're gonna manifest that something more in your life. So the more you think about the fact that he's sitting on the couch every day, the more that he's gonna sit on the couch every day. The more that he's thinking about 
you know, and the fact that she's spending too much money shopping, the more that that's going to happen. So right. the idea is to really not really judge the individual, but to really accentuate the positive things about them, to remind them every single day what is good about them, mm -hmm. what is it that you love the most about them. You know, in raising our children, my wife and I have had a commitment to really, more than anything, accentuate the good in them and really more ignore the bad in them. Meaning we give them so much reinforcement on the good that you see that there's hardly any bad. I'm not saying they're not going to make mistakes. We expect that. Yeah. But I'm just saying that on a daily basis, it's not about telling them, well, you're not studying enough or you're, not, you, uh, you're going out too much or you're spending too much money or I don't like the friends you're hanging around with. It's not about that. It's about accentuating. It's about reminding them of the good that they do. You know, that they're kind, they're loving, they're respectful. The fact that they're disciplined. Whenever you have an opportunity to do that with the other person, that's what we need to be spending time with. And when I wrote my last book, The Power of Self-Healing, which is now in 12 languages all over the world, I, um, I actually created an online program that actually guides people on a daily basis that I'm your coach reminding you how in 21 days you can self-heal physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And the reason that I did it in 21 days is because that's what most experts say that it takes the length of time that it takes to build a habit. Yes. So if I can at least teach you in 21 days how to build a habit, then I'm hoping that that will become a habit for life. But even though you finish it 21 days, and I'm going to recommend, let's do another 21 days. And then little by little, you start realizing that our habits are mostly unconscious behavior, that only 5% of our behavior is conscious. You know, a statistic I read the other day, and this is really interesting. It says that we have an, an average of 60,000 thoughts a day, 60,000 thoughts a day. 80% of those thoughts are the same thoughts that we had the day before, 80% oh. of them. And that 90% of that 80% are negative in nature. So that means that we ourselves have created this chaos that we live in. We have created this survival uh, state that we find ourselves in. We've created these relationships that are, are toxic in many ways. We've created the lack of abundance and the lack of financial ability to do the things you want to do when you want to do them with the people you want to do them with. So the good news is the fact that you can change that. You can change that by simply changing your thought patterns and changing your behaviors you're doing. So therefore, you can have a feeling in your life, like the feeling of love, that is what helps you attract everything that is good in the world. So that way you can have the abundance that you're looking for in all of these areas in your life and understanding that it was all up to you in the first place, that no one can make you something that you're not. You're allowing people to allow you to change who you are because no one can make you something you're not. You either give them permission or you decide to do it. But the problem is that we have not been taught how to do that. And in this process, all I'm trying to do is allow you to understand what are the tools in which you can actually gain control of your physical health, your emotional health, and the spiritual health, because that spiritual health is what connects us with what quantum physics call uh, the universal intelligence. It's an intelligence that runs the universe, but that's inside of us. We're connected. And you know what I found is that when you're connected with that intelligence, you never find yourself not having enough hope because when our physical limitations run into a limitation where a doctor says to you, you know, Mrs. Jones, there's nothing else we can do to help you. And I've interviewed thousands of patients that have healed when they were told they would never heal. You know what they had in common? They had hope. They believed that if there was some way out there that they were going to get better and they got better. So, so I want to make sure that you have the ability to understand that you have the power to do that by just being a little bit more kinder to yourself, waking up in the morning and just saying, I love you first thing in the morning, to be able to take 
advantage and don't take for granted that person lay, lay next to you because it may be the last time you see them. To be able to take time to get up enough time to have ch breakfast with your children and be able to enjoy them. Take them to school. That's one of my favorite things to do is to take my children to school whenever I'm in town. But most importantly, to be able to uh, not judge yourself so much that you realize that you are really more special than you think you are. That there's a spirit inside of you that is just perfect the way that it needs to be. And whenever you begin to embrace your imperfections and just accept them, but begin to work on your perfections and begin to celebrate them, now you have the secret of how it is that you can truly master this thing we call love. And that thing we call love, or this thing we call love, is the one thing that impacts every area of our lives. That's what we're having this conversation. That's what we're celebrating this week. That's what we want for each one of you that is listening right now. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Fab. We've uh, run out of time. I wish we had hours and hours more to go. It's been absolutely fascinating, and you've certainly got my mind going uh, on certain issues in my life, and I'm thinking, okay, you know, I'm on the right track here, and I'm just varied off the track a little bit there, so I'm going to pull it back in. And I just want to tell you how much I personally appreciate uh, you sharing your wisdom with us today. Well, thank you so much for the time, and um, I hope that for those of you that are listening, that you put yourself in a position where you can say, I love myself more today than I've ever loved myself. And let the rest just follow. Thank you so much, Scott. Thanks. And thank you, everybody, for watching us. We really appreciate having you along on this journey with us. And there's much more ahead, so stay tuned, and more details will be coming up. Bye-bye.